What's up team? A lot of you have requested a cantilevered retaining wall structural design. So obviously that's what we're doing here today. It's a full design example with everything hopefully answered that you could possibly have a question on. We do global stability checks and then obviously we are going to get into the design of the concrete and the rebar and the structure itself. So I hope all of you enjoy, have a happy holidays and I'll catch you in the auditorium. Let's get it. We have our beautiful cantilevered retaining wall. I didn't necessarily draw it to scale, obviously, because this thing is 20 feet tall, as you see on the left, and it's roughly 12 feet wide at the base. We have some criteria given to us at the top that's important for our design. The unit weight of the soil, 110 pounds per cubic foot, PCF. Then we have P sub A, which is an equivalent fluid pressure for active soil. That is, that is the soil that's being retained, and that's the force that is exerting horizontally on our retaining wall. That is 30 pounds per square foot, PSF. And then P sub P, which is the equivalent fluid pressure of the passive pressure of the soil over on the left-hand side down low, so like over here, um, which we will get into later, of 450 PSF, pounds per square foot. Now I say pounds per square foot, ultimately equivalent fluid pressure starts off as PCF, but commonly, like we do with concrete structures, uh, we design a one foot strip of wall. So we are taking that into account today. We are designing on a one foot strip basis, which means we have that one foot unit that we can deduct from our units of our equivalent fluid pressure. So PCF goes to PSF. That's why I did that. The coefficient of friction is 0.4. We're gonna be using that for our sliding checks today. And then we have one more parameter, the Live load surcharge that is being retained behind the wall, as you can see up top here, is not just a number that is given to us. It's actually equivalent to an additional two feet of retained soil. Now, today we are starting off by solving uh, and checking our global stability checks. So overturning, sliding, and bearing. And then after that, we'll go into designing the retaining wall, the concrete calculations and the rebar calcs to make sure that we are we're good that we have an adequate structure here. I'm gonna be denoting A as our active soil pressure, which is, uh, as we know, a triangular loading, which you have here. And we know that at the top, very simply, is zero PLF. But now let's start by solving the base, which is the largest pressure. And we are going to be uh, resolving moments about point A at the toe, as you can see here. So that means we need to take loads um, about the same elevation of the point that we are determining. So at point A, it's 20 feet plus one and a half feet, which is the thickness of um, the, the heel and the toe, which gets us 21.5 feet as I've shown right there. This triangular distribution is simply the height, which is 21.5 feet times PA, 30 PSF, 645. PLF. We ultimately want to find the resultant of this triangular load. So that's going to be your bottom third. And we are going to denote that as H sub A. And then we have this uh, rectangular distribution of load. And that is the horizontal distribution of load due to your surcharge up above. This is simply the calculation of the two feet of soil times the equivalent fluid pressure. So 30 PSF which gets you 60 PLF. And this will have a summation of force, which we'll denote as H uh, sub L. H sub A will have a moment arm that we'll denote as X sub A, and the surcharge will be X sub L. So right now what we're doing is we are finding the forces that are acting on our retaining structure. Now you might be saying, hey, what about our load case? Well, for the global stability checks, we know that we always um, run all of our calculations with uh, allowable design. So ASD, and we have soil, which is H, we have a live load uh, surcharge, and then we have dead load of our structure and retained soil and stuff like that. All of, all of those things just have load combinations with a 1.0 um, factor on them. So we don't need to plug this into a load combination. Well, I back that up. We are plugging into a load combination, but all of the factors are just 1-0, so we can kind of just skip that step. So that's what's happening there. We're not just neglecting it, but it's just 1-0 for everything. Now, H sub A is equal to the following. This divide by two is because it's a triangular distribution. So 
Um, in reality, even though I drew it kind of a skinnier triangle, um, it's always a perfect one half of a of a equally sided square. Um, so the the loading uh, height is equivalent to the loading depth for your triangle. So that divide by two just gets our triangle in case anyone was wondering there. That spits out the following. H sub L is equal to the following. Notice no divide by two here because it is a rectangular distribution. So it's just the full height times the demand. And that gets us. Now, what about our moment arms for both of these forces? Well, X sub A is just one third the height of the triangle. And that gets us 7.16 feet. And then for the rectangular distribution, it's just half the height of that loading. Now we can actually find the uh, overturning moment uh, demand basically on our structure. So let's solve that now. MOT, that's what I like to call it, uh, our overturning moment, but you can call it whatever you'd like, is equal to the following. Plug everything in for that, we get the following. All right, 63,515 pound feet for our overturning demand. Now we're gonna find the gravity loads acting on our system. And uh, here's the following definitions that I am using moving forward. The weight of the wall and the key is equal to the following. And I want to point out that the one foot here is for the one foot strip of the wall like we talked about. And then 23 feet is the height of the wall plus the height of the key, but does not include the thickness of the base. We are going to use that dimension when we solve for the weight of the base. So that's why I did that like that. It's not super crucial whether you do it an opposite way. If you were thinking of just taking the continuous height of that full stem, you can do that. You just need to remember when you're doing the weight of the base that you subtract that zone um, from the base. So, and then visually what I'm talking about here is we have an intersecting point here, right? And we don't want to account for this weight in the green box here twice. That's all. Next is the weight of the base. That equals the following. All right. And lastly, the live load plus the soil load. And those I'm just going to do cumulatively as well, and they get you the following. 19,360 pounds. Now notice just from an engineering kind of judgment, um, how much weight that is. The soil that is sitting on top of your heel of your cantilevered retaining wall is 20,000 pounds. So this whole zone right here, the weight that's sitting on it, and the reason that cantilevered retaining walls exist is because they work very well. They're very good at what they do. Um, otherwise, engineers in the past would have found a better way to do things. But the reason we settled on commonly using these retaining systems is because statically, all of that load that sits on the heel does a tremendous amount of work um, to counteract any type of retained soil moment that's created. That's how this system works, simply put. Is the soil sitting on the heel stops the whole thing from turning over because if, you're, if your concrete and your rebar is structurally adequate and strong enough and this thing was just a rigid system, you know, it couldn't, it couldn't break like that, the whole thing does this, the only way that you're going to create a failure mode from overturning is by picking up that heel and picking up all of this weight that's sitting on the heel. And from the numbers that we just ran, you can see how tremendously large of a number that is in comparison to the other weights that we just calculated. So something to, you know, food for thought, something to keep in mind as you move through here. And uh, one more thing to point out, this 22 feet, I simply took the 20 feet of the amount of retained soil sitting on top of our base and then I added the additional two feet because that's how the problem stated the surcharge is equivalent to two additional feet of soil sitting on top. So, okay, well now I want us to find the resultant gravity load. What I mean by this is that we have this cantilevered system right here. I don't know why I draw the heel so freaking long. Eh, get all that out of there. Okay, we have this system going on and we have you know load here, we have weight here, um, we have weight from the base centered here, you know, all the centroids of that independent weight that we just solved for. You got the live lo load up top. What we need to do, or what we want to do to make this more simple, is to find all of these added up and find the resultant load and find its location from point A. That way we can then just use a singular value to use moving forward in our design instead of having to keep track of all these independent 
weights and moment arms and just getting all tangled up in the weeds and it, it becomes difficult. I did that when I was younger, I think a lot of us do, but this resultant thing, you kind of learn over time and realize how much time and energy of keeping track of things, it saves you. Well, in order to do this, we, <laughs> I know I just said it, it avoids having to do all this, but we need to find all the independent um, moment arms of all of the loads that we just solved for up here. The reason I grouped these like I did is because that the ones that are grouped, they have the same moment arms. So that makes it a little more simplistic as well. First, XWK, that, is the weight of the wall plus the uh, the key. So we need to find this, X, W, K. You can pause it right here and you can use the dimensions that you see, but I'm gonna draw them in below. Then we're gonna find X, B, which is the centroid of the weight of the base. This is our base. So that's gonna be you know somewhere here. And again, use the dimension that you see to find the centroid. And we're going back again to point A, because that's where we're summing all of our moments about. So I'll draw that down below, but this is X, B. And then finally, we have the weight of our soil plus the weight of our surcharge. And that is ultimately gonna be somewhere relative to the center line of B, but, but not exactly. Um, and that is X, L, S. All right, I'm gonna head back down and throw everything in. All right, excellent. Now we have everything that we need in order to um, locate uh, the moment arm of our resultant weight. We do it with the following equation. We're gonna call this X bar, and it's equal to your local X times the weight of each one of the components that you were just solving for, divided by the summation of all of the weight. X bar turns out to be 7.37 feet from A. And we will wanna know that summation of mass that I solved for down here moving forward. So we're just gonna reiterate that. And I'm gonna call that summation W is equal to 27,348 pounds. Well, with all this information, we can now um, run our moment checks for our global stability. We know MOT is equal to the following, but now we need moment R, at least that's what I call it. I call it the resisting moment, so M sub R. Again, that's just for me. That's gonna be equal to the following equation, X bar times the summation of your weight. So see how simply put that equation becomes after we found the resultant, instead of like this weight times this, this uh, doing all of that. You did that once and now you can use a more simplified approach going forward. Beautiful. Well, that is clearly bigger than our overturning moment, but when we're doing uh, calculations for a retaining wall, the IBC has some specific language in it about factors of safety. So you can't just do a 1.0 like DCR, you actually need to apply additional factors of safety and meet a larger criteria. And that being that your factor of safety needs to be equal to 1.5 at a minimum. What is our factor of safety? That is simply equal to our M resisting over our M overturning. And that equals, uh, after you do the equation, 3.17, which is greater than 1.5 so that we know we are okay. All right, so our moment check is good. Let's move on to sliding. 